How are you today? Nice, thank you. I'm also fine. <laughs> I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk before you. And I had to make all the way through from St. Petersburg, and this is eight hours by train. So this is what you're going to do tonight. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you because the things I'm going to talk about, they really have some of the important implication on my life and so I really would like to share what I know, what I feel with you. Okay, so today, we have, yesterday you talked about the mission of the Messiah and life of Jesus and today we are going to take a more overall view on history and we'll talk about the parallels of history. Anyway, I hope you like studying history. Although, I met some people who didn't have very good time with studying history at school, and I can say this about myself, just frankly and truly. But there is greater value in studying history, even in case you are not naturally interested in this. Because ideally, we were supposed to learn from the mistakes of the past. And just it's, as in our everyday lives, when we come across a certain kind of of situation when we have to make a decision, if we make a mistake, then we want to make sure that next time we won't do the same thing again. Also, in history we find a kind of cycle or repetition according sometimes according to some time patterns. So what we'll be doing is we'll be answering in the first part of this presentation, we'll be answering the question, why does history repeat itself? Okay? And also, you've talked about already about the principles of restoration. And during this lecture, we'll see how have the principles of restoration been demonstrated on the national and world levels. So we'll bring up these principles right up to the modern times, and we'll see what we'll get. Okay? So again, why does history repeat itself? So is there something in history that must go on forever? If there is something that is inevitably must come again and again, if that was the case, then there wouldn't be much hope, because we can work really hard by trying to establish world of peace and harmony, but then see all things declining again and again. Now, according to the unification principle, there is an ultimate goal in history. There is a purpose in history. And ideally, our first ancestors were supposed to have reached perfection during their young lifetime. And so by the age of 21, internally and externally, they would have grown up to the same rate. But unfortunately, while they were still on the growth stage, while they were teenagers, they made a mistake and they died. They got cut off from God. And so what could have been done in 20 years took thousands of years to regain. It took thousands of years for God to raise us back to the point when the Messiah can now take up the rest of the way that our ancestors couldn't go. So the real meaning of history, that the real meaning of historical events is to raise up our spirit, to raise up our intellect to the point when we can freely feel God living inside ourselves, when we can feel God and see God walking with us, walking around us in the world. So the process of restoration is the process of salvation, of rescuing us back to this original ideal in which we were supposed to live and from which our ancestors fall into this corrupt world of misery, unhappiness, chaos, into hell. So the process of salvation is the process of rescuing us. And the key to this salvation is an appearance of a new man, the Messiah. And we need him like just a new person, like a new body, which, which is not sick, which doesn't suffer with the sickness of self-destruction. And with this come new men, come new women, come children, come others, come the new whole world of hope. <coughs> and this is the real meaning of history. So the process of restoration follows the process of indemnity. And it's a law of cause and effect of action and reaction, that whatever has lost its original position or status must be restored 
by setting up certain conditions. And setting up of these conditions is called indemnity. So, suppose there are two people who have loved each other, but are now on bad terms. In order for them to restore the relationship of true love, of the state of loving each other, they must set up a condition, at least of apologizing to each other. They have to do this. Yeah? In like manner, a man who has fallen by committing a sin must overcome the temptation to sin, and the whole way of sin, the whole way of evil must be overcome, must be, must be reversed. So the whole cause of the fall must be reversed. And the whole cause by which our ancestors have fallen must be reversed. Okay? But have you ever thought, why did Jesus came 2,000 years ago instead of 3 or 4,000 years ago? Just couldn't God send the Messiah straight up to the fall? Imagine going back to the terms of the Adam family. And do you know, do you remember the story about Cain murdering his brother Abel? Only because the last was more accepted by God, was closer to God. And if he did this to his own brother, think what he would do to the Messiah. So unfortunately, God can't set the Messiah whenever he feels like it. In some way, he depends on the people. He depends, he is looking for people in history who will establish the foundation for the Messiah to come, who will establish the foundation of faith by developing their faith in God, by restoring themselves into people whom God can trust. And on the other hand, he is looking for people who will develop between themselves the relationships based on God's highest ideal. So the foundation of faith is the vertical the relationship of vertical love, vertical connection between people and God. And the foundation of substance is the relationship of horizontal, is development of horizontal relationship between people on the earth. So that we truly feel that we are brothers and sisters are the one parent under God. So it really depends on people whether God's plan will be realized. If people fulfill their responsibility, then the plan is realized, and then restoration is completed. But if people fail to do this, that God's plan isn't realized, that God is eternal, He is absolute. Therefore, His will is also absolute and eternal. And whatever has been set up by God to be done, would be done eventually, in spite of everything, in spite even of how much time it can take for God's plan to be realized. So, when we fail to fulfill our responsibility, the restoration is prolonged. And God is working in history through central people, through central persons that he chooses, like Moses or Noah. And God chooses people with the strongest faith in him, the most righteous ones, the people who are closest to him. And so if these people fail to fulfill their, fulfill their responsibility, then God's will is accomplished. But if they fail, just God's restoration isn't completed then. God just finds another central person, and then a similar situation is set up. But it will happen in a different time and in a different place. But I'm sure this is why history repeats itself. It's very closely connected with the problem of the failure. Whenever people fail to fulfill their responsibility, then God has to redo what was lost, to restore the situation that had been lost by the people. And whenever he does it, next time it takes more effort to him to restore the situation. And he has to do this by expanding the level of his activity. It's like when we make a mistake, again, when we fall once, next time it's more difficult for us to resist to the same temptation. It's more difficult to resist not to act in the same way. So, we see this in history. First, God wanted to restore the foundation for the Messiah on the family level. And if this, that's what you talked about, about Abraham family. 
And if this family would have been completely successful at the right time, the Messiah could have come at that time. But if the faith in God's restoration is completed, it's prolonged. Mm. Actually, when the foundation on the family level was established for God, by this time there was a lot of other nations around on the same, who were under Satan's dominion who didn't care about God at all. And so if Messiah could have come to Abraham's family, to Abraham's descendants, that this family could be easily eliminated. Actually, so God had to find, who had to raise at least one nation with this kind of faith in God that Abraham and his descendants had. And so now God has to work on the national level. But if again people fail to fulfill their responsibility, then God has also again has again to expand the level of his activities and now work on the left world level. Because as his restoration is prolonged, the whole world of corruption expanded. And now God has to restore the world on the world level. And it becomes that much to restore what has been lost. So this is why history repeats itself. Yeah. And so you talked yesterday about the restoration on the family level, about the foundation for the Messiah on the family level. And now in the next part of this presentation, we'll see how has this principle of restoration been demonstrated on national and world levels. And Actually, in this part, I'm going to talk about 4,000 years of history of humankind. And I'm going to do it really fast, about 4,000 years in 40 minutes. That's about 100 years in a minute. It's really fast. So please pass me your seat okay? <laughs> so, but it's impossible to speak about everything that happened during this 4,000 years. It's even impossible to mention all the facts. And there is no need for this. Because as God chooses central people to walk through, in the same way God chooses the central nation that he is walking through, central history. And central history is the history where God is working most directly, trying to make people, asking people to make a foundation for the Messiah by establishing the foundation of faith, the foundation of substance. Central history is the history where the Messiah comes. But actually, it doesn't, all the other histories are peripheral. But it doesn't mean, if they're called peripheral, that they're not important for God. Because God is a loving parent for everyone. And He wants to restore everyone. And His ideal to raise up every child of His, just whenever He can be. And that's why God, but in central history, God can talk to people because maybe they are more prepared, they are closest to him, they have more faith in him. But on the other hand, God is working all around the world, raising up all people to the level, to the spiritual level of their, develop to, of their development, so that they will be able to receive the Messiah eventually, after he is accepted in the central history, in the center. So, maybe it sounds interestingly for you, we say that central history is the history of religion. Because this is through religion that God is communicating to men. This is through the religion that God is conveying his truth to men. So, the famous historian Anna Toynbee pointed out that religion is the source of all cultures. It's the basis of all cultures. Religion is the source of ethics and morals, and on the foundation of religion is all the stuff that economics, politics, culture, science develop. And the most central among religions is the histories about, of Judaism and Christianity. Because these are the two religions that are mostly concerned with the coming of the Messiah. But while... And so people... In the, in the history of Judaism and Christianity, had the mission, the world, the mission, in, and a very difficult cause actually, because they have been paying indemnity for the whole world, because the Messiah comes to these religions, and all the others at the same time. Meanwhile, God is inspiring. God inspired 
the appearance of such religions as shamanism, Islam, Confucianism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, all around the world, just to really to talk to people in accordance with their needs, and so that eventually that will be able to accept the Messiah. So, as already you might have assumed, in this presentation we'll talk about two histories, the history of Israel and the history of Christianity. And I hope that you will notice, and actually this is my aim to show it to you, that in these two histories we can trace some remarkable parallels between the history of Israel and the history of Christianity. And this is due to the fact that these religions have the same mission. They have to prepare the foundation for the Messiah. So the history of Israel started with Abraham, the father of faith of Jewish people. And I don't have much time to go into details, but somehow through Abraham and his descendants, the foundation of the family level was established. But also, as I said already, there were a lot of nations, a lot of people around who didn't care about God. And so God had to raise up at least one nation who would believe in him with the same kind of faith that Abraham and his descendants did. And so what has been done in the history of Israel is that the foundation for the Messiah on the family level has been expanded to a national level. And Finally, after many trials, after many events in the history of Israel, the Jewish people managed to establish the foundation of faith and the foundation of substance on the national level. And then Jesus could have come to this nation. But unfortunately, the most prepared people, the chosen people, failed to recognize him as their savior, failed to accept him as the Messiah, this is not, as you, as you said, as you talked already, that's not because of the people but itself, but because of the situation that was in the world, because of the failure of their religious leaders to, to really accept Jesus and to show people who he was. And so the Son of God cried out that he was the Son of God, but his words fell on deaf ears, and he was never understood. He was branded a blasphemer, and finally he was crucified. And through this crucifixion, all the rock of God, all the foundation that heaven that had been established for the Messiah was lost. And so only half salvation was brought. The salvation, spiritual salvation for believers. Spirit, so the spirits now, the spirits of those who really believe in victorious Christ can go after our physical death into the realm which is free from satanic influence, but still we live in this physical world of misery and unhappiness, and still people hate and hurt each other very often, just almost every moment. And the sufferings of God, who is watching this, who is watching this constantly, has been prolonged. So this is why, actually, the second coming of the Messiah is necessary. And this is why the indemnity foundation that have been lost must be restored. And this is what has been done in the history of Christianity. So in the history of Christianity, the previous indemnity foundation for the Messiah has been restored. But now this foundation has expanded to the world level. When Jewish people failed to fulfill their mission, to fulfill their responsibility, then God just didn't choose another nation to walk through, to walk with, but He started walking with Christianity. People of the whole world united with their belief that Jesus Christ was somehow the Messiah. And so, walking on the world level, God at the same time is regaining the foundation of the national and world levels. And from the point of the mission of Christianity, we should say that Christianity is second Israel, because it has the same mission. The mission of the Christianity is to establish a foundation of faith and foundation of substance for the coming of the Messiah, this time on this worldwide level. 
And that what God has been inspiring, has been pushing up in his people, in his church to do. And first did this. And actually, um, one of the history of Christianity is the restoration of history for the history of Israel. Because whatever has been done wrong in the history of Israel, whenever people felt their responsibility must be rest have to be restored in the cause of Christianity. That's why there are so many parallels. And you'll see these parallels in two histories in spite of different times, different cultures, different circumstances involved. Okay. So the history of Israel started with Jacob, who at a certain point got the name of Israel, the victor of faith. And his 12 sons became the foundation for 12 tribes, and the whole nation of Israel came from the 12 tribes. So, <coughs> Actually, the history of Israel started when Abraham, his 12 sons, and 70 family members went into Egypt, <coughs> where they first they were welcomed, but then turned into slaves. <coughs> so, <coughs> um, this time of slavery in Egypt was a time of tremendous suffering for Israelites. <clears throat> and it was they who helped to build up pyramids and temples in Egypt. And at this time, people didn't use grains, and so you can imagine how difficult it was. And they were treated in in a way that just any Egyptian could kill them, and he wouldn't be punished for this in any way. But in spite of all tremendous suffering, they maintained their faith. They believed that God is with them, and also. Somehow they expanded, and by the end of this 400 period of slavery in Egypt, according to the Bible, there were 600,000 only men, Jewish mm, Hebrew men in Egypt, just even not counting women and children. But still, they were in a miserable situation. But God wanted to send them a Messiah. That was the nation He wanted to send the Messiah to. And so, to make better situation, to make a proper situation, God inspires Moses to lead them, to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Actually, Moses, I would say he is the second glorious figure, the second largest figure in the history of Israel after Jesus. And Moses came like a liberator of the Israelites. And he took them out of Egypt and it took 40 years for Israelites to come from Egypt into Canaan, into the promised land of Canaan that was given to them by God. And on the way from Egypt to Canaan, Moses received from God the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments that became the source of morals and ethics of Israel. So the period of slavery lasted for 400 years. It was a period of suffering, but at the same time people kept their faith, they expanded, and the main result of this period is that, pe that the Israelites got their land. They became a nation. <coughs> it's very interesting that in the history of Christianity, we trace the same thing. The history of Christianity also started with persecution. The early Christians went into Rome with the purpose to turn it into a Christian nation. And there, although we don't know much about the oppression of Israelites in Egypt, because the only source for our knowledge is Bible records, but it's very brief and laconic, I would say. But we have many evidences about what was going on in Rome at that time. And we know that the Christians were severely oppressed. and they were fed to the lions for entertainment. They were killed for entertainment. And they were even burnt alive. And Emperor Nero, I think he's right about it, he just liked to light his parties with these living torches, these burning Christians. It's even hard to imagine for a modern person that it was so. But actually, in spite of all these sufferings, more and more people started believing that Jesus was the Messiah. And Christianity extended from Israel to Rome, from Rome to Europe, to Africa, in Africa to such countries as Ethiopia, 
and all around North Africa, it spread it to Asia Minor and to the world. And at the end of this 400 year period, just amazing things happened. In 392, Christianity was declared an official religion in the Roman Empire. In the nation that had persevered Christians most severely. So, like Israelites got their land at the end of this 400 year period, Christianity also gets a land, gets a nation, the Roman Empire. So, but let's come back again to the history of Israel. Okay? So, each of 12 tribes that came to the land of Canaan settled in its own place. And at the head of each tribe, there was put a person called judges. And these judges were not like judges today. They were like political and spiritual leaders at the same time. Like priest, prophet, and king at the same time. And the mission of the judges was to enforce the law and to spread out the teachings that Moses had received. But actually, the main flaw with this system was that there was a kind of, it was a kind of feudal society, I would say, because of the 12 tribes, 12 leaders, and of the land allotted to each tribe. And you can see the map of how they were settled out around Canaan. And there was no central authority in this country at this time. And this was internal threat for the country. But on the other hand, they were constantly attacked by the Philistines from outside. That was an external threat. But anyway, the period of the judges that lasted for 400 years, it was the period when the country became independent, that when it accumulated its own traditions, and the law of Moses really became the basis of law and of morals and ethics according to which people lived. And in Christian history, again, there are people whose mission was similar to the mission of the judges. They were church patriarchs. In the Christian world at this time, there were five major Christian centers centering on big cities such as Rome, Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, Alexandria. And at the head of each city there was a church patriarch. And the mission of the church patriarch was to spread out Christianity in his era and to turn people to Christianity. And like judges, they also were spiritual and political leaders at the same time. They were like king, monk, and priest at the same time. So, but also, at this time, there was an external threat for Christianity. And actually, in 600 AD, Muhammad came. And when he came, his mission, his mission was similar to the mission of Moses. And because people had, people of Europe had failed to accept Jesus, and so his teaching never came to the Arab people. So the mission of Muhammad was to spread the teaching of the heavenly law and the teaching that we are living under one God to the Arab people and to unite them. And unfortunately, after the death of Jesus, Instead of uniting with Christianity, that was a kind of, I would say, God's ideal, God's plan, <coughs> Christianity and Muslims have been constantly attacking each other. Just been not like brothers and sisters. So the, church, the period of Church Petra is very similar to the period of the judges in the histories. And <coughs> In both cases, in the history of Israel and in the history of Christianity, God's plan at the end of those two periods was to bring unity at last to the countries, to unite people, so that later on this foundation of unity, they could have accepted the Messiah. And the foundation for the United Kingdom of Israel was laid out when Prophet Samuel, one of the judges, in not just King Saul to be the first king of Israel. And it was a very, the period of the United Kingdom was a very important time in the history of Israel 
was a glorious time in the history of Israel, I should say. And this is the time when a strong monarchy power developed, and also at this time the temple was built. And the meaning of the temple in the history of Israel is very important, because God inspired people to build this temple, because it was to really needed people to gather in one place with one aim, to worship God. Just the temple could serve one purpose, just like training people before the coming of a live Messiah, so that people would know, would learn how to behave themselves in accordance to him. So the construction of the temple was built during the reign of King Solomon. And there were three great kings in the history of the United Kingdom, King Saul, King David, and King Solomon. I'm sure you have heard many good things about all of them. And they were great people. But unfortunately, all of them, at a certain point, became corrupted and turned into immorality. And, for example, Solomon, mm, in his reign, the, the United Kingdom really achieved his most glorious, it was the glorious and the most glorious time in the history of Israel, the reign of King Solomon. But also, mm, it was the most bad time because actually Solomon, he, he was kind of a corrupted person at the end of his reign, and he had many political marriages. He had about seven hundred wives, and his wives. Yeah. And all his wives brought about brought with them their false gods because they were from foreign countries. And Solomon allowed them to worship those gods inside the temple. Thus even breaking the first commandment, thou shalt not be the other god worship. And actually originally this time of the United Kingdom for God was the time when he would be able to find the Messiah at the end. If people would have been able to unite, if they fulfilled their responsibility, the Messiah could have come at that time. But unfortunately, as we saw it at this time, and as it happened many times before, and as it would happen afterwards, people failed to fulfill their responsibility. And unfortunately, we see the same thing happening in the Christian history. So, the United Christian Kingdom started in 800 AD when Pope Leo III crowned the French king to be emperor of the Frankish Empire, Charlemagne, Charles the Great. Actually, he was a great person. He was a person with very high God's ideals. And um, the country established by him, the Holy Roman Empire, really symbolizes the United <coughs> Christian Kingdom. And he built many churches around the country and many educational centers. And I would say that this time in the hist that at this time the Holy Roman Empire was the highlight of the culture in Europe, the highlight of the culture in the world I would say. Like Israel, like the United Kingdom of Israel was the highlight of culture of its time. And Again, God hoped that he would be able to bring the Messiah into this kingdom of unity, peace, and prosperity. Because there was a strong monarchy power, a Jewish strength during this time. But again, people fall into corruption, into misery. And truly, not very long after his anointing as <coughs> emperor, Charlemagne Fall, fall into disagreement with Pope. And these disagreements became even worse between Charlemagne's descendants and the papacy. And so the Messiah couldn't come again. So, again, let's come back to the history of Israel. I hope you are not tired of just jumping because it's a big jump, 2,000 years, isn't it? But anyway, after Finally, Solomon was rebelled against, and the whole thing fell apart. And the United Kingdom of Israel fell in, mm, divided into two parts. The northern part of Israel, <coughs> consisting of ten tribes, and the southern part of Judah, consisting of ten tribes. And Judah remained faithful to God's ideal at this time. 
while Israel became, was becoming more and more corrupted, and people turned into festiveness, sometimes studying, worshipping gold calves. And God really wanted to restore the situation, and he sent many prophets to come from the south. I'm sorry. So God really wanted to restore the situation, and he saw many prophets from the south to the north to really make people to repent and to turn back to God. And here this is one of the prophets just making people, trying to make people to repent for worshipping the gold calf. But unfortunately, in spite of all the events that had been done by God to unite the former united country, everything was in vain. And so at the end of this 400 year period, the northern part of Israel was taken by Assyrians and the whole country was wiped off the surface of the earth and those who survived were scattered around the world. Actually, this is from where the lost ten tribes of Israel come from. And later, the southern part, Jordan, was taken by Babylonians. So this was the end of the former united and dropped prosperous kingdom for some time. But so the same, thing, the same thing happened in the history of Christianity. Again and again we see these parallels and Charlemagne and his descendants were able to keep Europe in control for 120 years only. And then afterwards, finally, it got divided into two parts. Into the western part of France and the eastern part of Germany. And again, like in case of Judah and Israel, Germany was more religious, was closer to God, while France was rebelling more and more against God, was becoming more and more secular. And that was a time of corruption and confusion in the church. And really God sent many prophets and reformers or saints at this time, like St. Francis. I don't know how many people we are here from San Francisco. Anyway, you all have heard about St. Francis. He has been a great person. And so, St. Francis, sometimes when he was outdoors, he really experienced God very deeply. But he noticed when he came to the church, he couldn't find God in there. That was the thing, that was the thing to think over. And so actually finally he went to the Pope, and Pope led him to have a church of his own, and everything was okay. But meanwhile, the, whole, the main body of the church still remained corrupted. And so God sent many signs to people, such as defeat in the crusades, to make the priests and the Pope and the people to repent, to change the situation in the church. You know that at this time, Jerusalem, was attacked by the Muslims. But because there was so much corruption in the Christian church, God just couldn't give the victory to the Christians. Actually, Christianity had the position closer to God. And you remember, Jesus taught people, you should love people, you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that was the mission of Christianity, to learn how to love people, to love other nations, to love all the other religions around, and to really unite with them and not to attack Muslims. And they were like, that was done by Christianity. So the Crusades were a terrible failure. And that was one of the signs of that time. So this period lasted for 400 years. And like the period in the history of Israel, it was the time of separation and corruption. And in the history of Israel, as I said, you remember me. Yes. Judah was taken by Babylonians. And so all Jewish leaders were taken into Babylon into captivity. And this period was, is known as the period of Babylonian captivity. And they were kept there for 70 years. And the Jewish people, that was a time of tremendous suffering, a time of famine, of hunger, that, that was <coughs> going on in the country. But at the same time, it was a kind of transformation, a time of kind of purification, because people who got into this kind of situation started turning their hearts back to God. Actually, that's what happens to us in our everyday lives. When we get into a difficult situation, then we just really come to God as our last hope. And so, after 70 years, Babylon was taken by Persia, 
And the Persian king Cyrus issued a decree letting Jewish people come back to Judah. But when they came back, they brought with them from Babylon all their bad habits. And for 70 years, they managed to assimilate with the Babylonian population. And many of them started worshipping gold calves and having the way of life just that was kind of different from God's ideal. So although they came back to Judah externally, internally still they were very far from God. And so God said it took 140 years more to really bring people back to God. It took 140 years of desperate God's work through many prophets such as Nehemiah, Ezra, to really make people to repent, to judge them strictly so they would turn back to God, that they would give up the wrong ways of life that he had. And actually, it was a time of transformation and purification for the people. And by the end of this time, we should say that they come back to God. And again, the same thing in the history of Christianity. Isn't that remarkable? And in 1309, the French king, Philip the Fourth, made the French made the Pope to move from Rome into Avignon in southern France because he wanted to have his own French papacy, whom he would have been able to command. And so, this period, I think maybe in the books on history, you made such name for this period as the period of Babylonian captivity of the papacy. So people really see this parallels in histories, in two histories. But, then, but just historians couldn't point out clearly the cause of the existence of such parallels. So also, like in Israel, that was a time of suffering and hunger, in Europe that was a time of black death, of plague, and it was a terrible <coughs> disaster. A one third of the European population died. And also, at the same time, it was a time of a kind of purification and transformation for people. Because really they started re-estimating some values in their lives. And so in 70 years, Pope was returned back to Rome. The papacy was returned back to Rome. But this event didn't finish the confusion in the church. And I should say that the 140 years that followed was the time of the most corruption in the church during all its existence. Because there was so much confusion in the church, even with sometimes three popes reigning at the same time, each claiming to be the only pope. And then sometimes popes were found in beds with married women, and they even had illegal children. And this was the time when they started selling indulgences. So actually, what is indulgences? Forgiveness of your sins. And if you pay money, you will be forgiven, whatever you have committed. And it doesn't matter. The more you pay money, the more forgiveness you receive, just in spite of what you've done before, or even you can pay in advance for, for what you're just not even thinking of doing. Just have you ever read about such things in the Bible? I don't think so. So, at this time, there were some people who really felt the necessities for some changes. And actually, we'll talk about these people in the next period, okay? So, again, like we did so many times, back to the history of Israel. And we'll see that um, the period after people really managed to change internally, then a very important period started a period of preparation for the Messiah. And this is a really great period in the history of Israel, a period of very deep reform and development. And during this time, the temple was rebuilt. And you remember what was the meaning of the temple for Jewish people. It was destroyed during when Babylonians took the Judah. So this time, the temple is restored. So the faith of Jewish people is restored. That's a symbol for it. And on the other hand, the religious democracy just, I would say, was developed at this time because people were not anymore forced to follow the laws. But after Ezra and other prophets, they were just 
they could follow the laws, follow their conscience. They would really feel what they do. And the whole environment was prepared for the coming of Jesus. Because even the Roman Empire itself, it was a prepared instrument in the hands of God through which the message brought from one man could have been spread out to the whole world. And at the same time, around that time, a great people appeared in history. Socrates in Greece, just Zoroaster in Persia, Buddha in India, Confucius and Lao Tzu in China. And everyone came with a mission of their own, with the teaching of their own. Gautama Buddha comes to India, which is separated with caste discrimination. And the caste discrimination was very strong in India. For example, the inter-caste marriages were strictly forbidden, and people belonging to different castes even couldn't have meal together. And how people <coughs> being on this level of development could accept the teaching of Jesus who taught that we all are equal. And so God, that we all are equally loved by God. And so Gautama Buddha teaches that all people, in spite of their belonging to the caste, partake from Buddha's nature. <coughs> so at this time, Lao Tzu came with his deep insights into the order of things in the universe, in what was going on around. And Confucius, with his teaching about the ideal family, that the ideal family is the foundation of the ideal world. So that was really a period when all the conditions were prepared for the coming of Jesus. It really took place at the end of this 400 year period. So, and in 1517, the period of preparation for the second coming started in the history of Christianity. And this is also a time of great reform and development, and it started with Martin Luther, a professor of Gutenberg University, who in 1517 started the religious Protestant Reformation. And this re the Reformation that started in religion changed the whole political and economical situation in the world. And the great example of this is the development of the democracy system, democracy social system. And the great example is the United States of America, the Declaration of Independence that, that said that all people, are, that the human rights given to people by God. And now man has the right to take this original rights from people. And the whole environment has been prepared for the God. Just this is the age of global communication. I mean, it's, it was difficult to imagine 100 years ago that it would take 10 hours to get from the United States here to the Soviet Union. But this is true. You can call to any part of the world and just say, oh, hi, mom. Oh, how things are going on there? Yeah, it's great. Really, it's going on great here on Earth. We just see it. So, <coughs> so this period, preparation for the second coming, is really to see the fruits of us here in our everyday life. And it's a really time of reform and development. So, we see there have been very remarkable parallels in both histories, in the history of Israel and the history of Christianity. Just the both started with persecution and suffering, and the period of kind of feudal society, strong monarchy, divided kingdom, suffering, and then a period of preparation for the second coming. And if we look from this point of view on history, then we see that history is not just some events occurring here or there without any law, without any Sequence. Just we see that God's work doesn't end with Bible record because God is still working within history and his work continues until today. So it's really important for us to keep in mind because it makes us think about the importance we live in now, the importance of the times we are living in now. Because let's just do simple mathematics. Yeah? And if we have 400 to 1517, what year shall we get? Actually, 1917. And I think you, you have heard about this year for sure. And it's like Jesus who had prophesied that before the last days, 
there will be a time of turmoil, and that was that what had happened in 1917. Jews said that the nation would rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there would be wars and rumors of wars, and that what happened. And actually, this country, I can tell you, I live here. This country is still trying to overcome the result of what had been done in 1917. So, <clears throat> if um, if um, uh, 400, 400, 120, 400, 210, and 400 again, we we'll get 1930 because this is not such an exact period like 400. Sometimes 399, sometimes 211 years and something. So this is the period between 19 and 17, between 1930, the period when Messiah could come, and this is really a period of turmoil, the period of suffering, and really can say that that means that these are the signs maybe that we are living in the time of the last days and i'm sure you have heard this word last days many times in your life so this is what even science talk about and many scientists talk about the over the global overwhelming the just all um, the ozone laser and many other things and they said that the earth would be destroyed and they predict this and many other things. And on the other hand, people who take Bible literally, they say, yes, that there will be last days and the earth will be destroyed completely. And so, but what is the real meaning of the last days? Because as you further read it, there are many symbolic places in the Bible. And I think fire is a very good example of this. Because Jesus said in Luke 12, 49, I came to cast a fire. Have you ever heard of Jesus setting up someone's houses on fire? So clearly, he was talking about not a real fire, not literal fire. In the other place, in Jeremiah 23, 29, we found that God's word is corresponded to fire. So this is God's truth. This is God's word that is really reforming us that is cleanses us, that is kindling our hearts on fire. That is what Jesus said. I have come to kindle your hearts on fire, to kindle fire within your heart. So this is very important to keep in mind. So that really, the last <coughs> days is the days when God's ideal, the ideal world that is, would be realized by three blessings. And this can only happen when God reveals his truth to us. We accept this truth and we'll try to act in accordance with truth. We'll make a decision to act in accordance with God's ideal. And it's time we, we can really in, perform our individuality centered on God and to create an ideal family. And this is the time we can really have an, a dominion of real true love over the creation. So, the meaning of the last days is that the last days is end of Satan's dominion and beginning of God's dominion. In this sense, there are the last days, the last days of evil. But again, I want to stress that they will become last days only in case we make a determination to leave, to leave the ways of Satan and to take up God's way. And so the last days is end of evil history and beginning of good history. So in some sense, they are just new days. They are the days of new, beautiful history. And also it's a time of dramatic change in hope. And really, the society has been changed to a great extent. The world has been changed. And I would say that the world had never developed so rapidly, had never changed so rapidly as it did in the 20th century. And even 99% of all the scientific knowledge have been obtained in the 20th century. That speaks for itself. And it's really a time of hope. It's a very important time. A time of very important history. It's a kind of crossroad where the old evil history meets the new, newly born goodness new history. And it's not a peaceful time at all. Because you've seen it many times in history. Whenever something new is introduced, it always means rejection and misunderstanding. 
And I don't speak about religion, that's not necessary. For example, Helen Leo died in prison only because people of his time were not able to accept his words. And just what is very common for us is because he was t talking just about simple laws of the cosmos, simple laws of the universe. So it's really a very important time when the sky comes and if we fulfill our responsibility and if we, we accept them and we follow God's word, then really it will be a great time when goodness will reign for eternity. When this ideal world based on God's three blessings will be realizing. And actually this is what Jesus was teaching about. Because ideal what is first blessing? It's an opportunity for us to learn how to love God with all our hearts. And this is Jesus' first commandment. This is what Jesus taught. And second lesson is opportunity to learn how to love all people around us, how to learn our neighbors as we love ourselves. This is what Jesus taught. And actually, I should say that we should also be able how to learn to love in a proper way the creation around us because we are part of this creation. So in some sense we should learn how to love creation as ourselves too. So the last days are the first days, the first days when we can witness the fulfillment of these three blessings. This is the fulfillment of a great new history. And I would say that last days is our time. We are living in the time of the last days. It really makes us think. But so, the last days is a time when a new understanding of truth must appear. And just let me read to you something from the Bible. <coughs> this is what Jesus said about, and this is John 15, 12. I have much more to say to you more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. And really, this new truth, we really need it, because there are so many misunderstandings of the Bible, so many confusion between different Christian denominations. And one of the same thing is interpreted in so many ways, and we really need the explanation that will be given from God's viewpoint. And so this new truth it must explain the nature of God. And if God is in yang, in and yang, masculinity and femininity, internal and ex internal, external form and internal character, and also, on the other hand, God is a being of the heart is the being of true love, and God is the being of law, and many other things. So each religion will find this explanation whatever they need. And Buddhists would accept the new truth from the viewpoint of Buddhism, and Confucianists from the point of view of Confucianism, and Christians from the point of view of Christianity. So everything would find, every religion would find what they need. And so this new truth and the purpose of creation, and what is the origin of the world, and the purpose of the inside, and how can mankind be restored? Because this is, these are the questions that mankind has been answering, trying to answer for so many times. And we really need to get the answers for this question. And so, Jesus also said in John 16, 25, the hour is coming, and I will tell you plainly of the Father. This time is coming. So, this new understanding of truth that will bring unity among people of all religions and ideologies. And really, a great time would come. A time of real unity of people. And this is also, well, I can find. Anyway, this is what Jesus talked about. And he said, Mm. This is the Revelation 21, 3, 3 to 5. And I heard 
A loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things had passed away. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. So, when this kind of world come, how will we be able to achieve this? What can we do to really obtain this kind of world? And Jesus also said, the spread and, the, and it also says in Revelation, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. So this is this water of life that is really giving us this rebirth. It's really giving us opportunity to bring this unity among ourselves, to bring unity on this earth. What is water of life? This is God's love. This is God's true love, and that we never feel, never we can experience it. And we can really change ourselves inside. Because as many people taught in history, Buddha and as Christians, it's evidently that the reason of all hardships, of all turmoil in the world is the suffering within the person, within the individual. And when we would be able to unite our mind and body with an ideal relationship with all the other people could be established. And it's really a very important time for ourselves because we should I would say that maybe that's a time for people to pray about to get the answers. Because just open your heart and mind. Because God really wants us to receive the message he is trying to convey and even a person doesn't believe in God, even someone doesn't believe in God, God still able to talk to them if their heart and mind is open. So just really it's very important time and we can really change this world. We can eliminate the barriers existing between different nations, the barriers existing between all of us and we would really be able to unite like brothers and sisters under one parent, under God. This is our hope, our belief. Thank you very much. Approximately 4,000 years of history, so if you think you've got a detailed explanation, you ain't had nothing yet. Uh, but I think she did a really wonderful job, so I really appreciate her, her efforts in explaining this. And, uh, also, you must know that uh, for many Soviets, Find the open pit. Exactly how you become a member, what are the things that you have to either say you believe or agree to do, and you know, how, how does one become a member? Well, anybody know how to become a member of the education <laughs> No. <laughs> Normally, um, just as, I don't know, I can speak from my experience, uh, every person's experience is a little bit different. Uh, some people join the unification movement quickly, some join it over a long period of time. But very, almost nobody, I, nobody that I know has ever joined the unification movement without doing a really thorough kind of study of the, uh, the lectures that you've heard here. Uh, we have. Yes. I'm sorry, is there like a, something such as a Nicene Creed, you know, that you have to say to 
I guess finding God in the unification movement, or God finding you, or one or the other. Uh, I I know of nobody in the unification movement that has come here uh, without having some personal experience with God and some feeling some kind of personal direction in their life, which was, I guess, inspired or catalyzed by their study of the principle. So they, it, it usually starts at a very intellectual level, you know, studying the principle over a series of lectures, advanced programs that are offered, and so on. And then that, I think, has motivated people to begin their own personal you know, search for God, their own personal uh, you know, effort to find God in their life and to actualize the things that we talk about. And then, of course, you can sign a paper and <laughs> you remember, but that's about it. Uh, but then in terms of lifestyle, you know, that's, uh, that's the effort that we all try to make to live up to these ideals. I think the only other thing I would add is that some of us have chosen I mean, some of us are just crazy about the movement and crazy about what it is we have. We want a, you know, personal spiritual growth and development through this type of life. So some of us make a very heavy-duty commitment of um, wanting to practice. In other words, the emphasis, you remember, in hearing the principles of restoration, that there are ways to engineer our way back toward ultimate spiritual health, or you might call it deeper levels of salvation, that is, distance from evil and uh, self-destruction and closer to God, and closer to our true self. So, uh, just like with any other religious organization or anything, even, you know, weightlifting, you can really go into it or really not go into it. It depends on how seriously you want to get into shape. And if you really want to get into spiritual shape, you can make some very serious commitment. And so there are different levels. Uh, in other words, some people want to be full-time involved and do all they can do that is challenging to them to both maybe share the message with other people and do the kinds of work that we do, and also ch challenge themselves. So for instance, I mean, some people would want to go to another country maybe, where the movement is small and work there, and do all kinds of things to enlarge themselves and come closer to God, and others don't feel the need to do that. So there are different levels of uh, involvement in the movement. Uh, you join those different levels by just wanting to be involved. Uh, if I may follow that up. Uh, so if the movement, is, as I understand it, is, is so much based on experience, what is going to happen when the founder is not there anymore as far as coherence and the movement not, you know, getting drawn or towards all kinds of directions and some weird things, new theology happening, as is the case, or as has been the case with religions that usually as long as the founder was alive, you know, everything was fine, and when the founder went away, you know, things started. Why do you think this will not happen? Disciple and the first son of the founder. Offspring and first disciple. Always split. And our movement, which is not a movement based so much on demand as on the principle. And the principle has an enduring, unifying influence in our movement. And that will remain regardless of what happens. And also there are many, um, remember one's family, and also many, many members have studied with him for a long time. So I think there's not so much danger of that because there's such a strong foundation uh, at this point. There's just so many people who understand the principle well and the common direction. And the principle itself has been articulated so fully that I think um, there's much less danger of that. But it is something that we think about. Reverend Moons, is, he's the one founder of the church, but also there's a co-founder and that is Mrs. Moon. Amen. So, you know, this is the safeguard, I feel, against this problem that, you know, this is not a typical situation in most religions or most organizations. So, um, the real emphasis of our principle is embodied within them, within them as a couple, the, uh, <coughs> their understanding, their practice, their traditions, the heart, of the principle that's practiced in their life and in their family. So even when she goes to spirit world, they have their children. And those traditions are being instilled in them as well. And as far as I know, all of them, every single one of them, from the oldest to the youngest, uh, is really committed to live this way of life. Not because it's their parents' way of life, but because they themselves have gone through their own search to discover if this is really true for them too, because even though it's what their parents believe, 
you know, as, as we all know, there comes a time in our life where we all have to decide our own values and our own beliefs. So it's it's um it's mainly the the principle that is just passed on within their family and and extended out to the larger movement, as John was saying, because we have a concept that the the, mess, the Messiah's role, and uh, just to get to the point, is not something exclusive, but it's something that we all are trying to achieve in our own lives. So we believe that uh, every single one of us has the role to become a Messiah, you know, for others and for our families, or to become true parents, you know, to, to establish a real unconditional parental kind of love in our lives. So this is really the essence. It's not... It, can you understand? Yes. Uh, I don't want to take any more time, but I just would like to follow the thought. Um, what I can see... Uh, <laughs> uh, if, if I may make some parallels with some other religion, uh, religious traditions, for example, um, I know other, like for example in Islam, where there was a clear emphasis on the teaching and not on the man, because you know it's the teaching that matters. And nevertheless, after you know the founder went, you know, died, there is all kinds of divisions. So who is supposed to lead the community? And some people said, no, it has to be like the household of the the, the founder. And some said, no, 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 it doesn't matter what we want. And I mean, it's, and then all kinds of things develop as to what it was supposed to be and. Is there a real consensus on who will lead the movement in, in the future, or is it just kind of an agreement that yes, maybe it's the uh, house, but, but then maybe it's not? I mean, I can see a problem uh, with that in the future, that there's going to be disagreements. But we don't see them as being, you know, wherever Moon is the only leader. We see she is the leader and parent as well. So it's very natural that when he goes to the spirit world, it's just like when in a family, right? When the father dies, the mother is basically leading the family. So in the same sense, that's how we see. What if there's see. a mother? Well, then there's the eldest son. I see. You know. <laughs> so and there's 12 after that, and then there's all of us. Okay. So whoever. In your presentation, then, the cycles of abuse in, and violence, poverty, homelessness, AIDS, have all been attributed to the breakdown of family structure, which is fine, but I'd like someone to comment in light of that on um, arranged marriages and um, how that works and how you can have a spiritually significant other when it is arranged. Not in the world today. Arranged marriages. It's just certainly not common in America. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I guess speaking from experience, uh, it works great. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. Because <laughs> you have to speak from experience in order to answer that question. And if you haven't had the experience, it's very difficult to answer. Uh, I think statistics speak for themselves in one sense. And within our movement, we have a, I think, compared to national statistics in America and so on, we have a very, very low divorce rate. So, um, and in terms of the problems that you're addressing, uh, diseases, sexually transmitted diseases, and so on like that, that's virtually non-existent in our movement because of the strict moral code, I think, that we live by. Um, and that's one aspect of her question, I think. Uh, maybe, I just, I just was going to say. I'm, I'm very sure that uh, since I lived in America and European form, it's a very strange concept, actually, to Western European or American mentality. But I've also worked in Asia, in many countries in Asia, and I've seen, you know, societies where that's the normal common practice. But then you might wonder, what kind of mentality allows that? Uh, that we, for example, have somebody else suggest uh, our spouse. And from a purely religious point of view, think of it this way. And this is, I'm also speaking from experience, by the way. My wife is sitting in the back there. Uh, and I'm very pleased to announce that it's a very happy marriage. And, uh, you know, I can say that um, if, let's say, if you're a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim or somebody and the religious leader of your faith, whom you love and respect, and who you trust, through whom God is working, were to offer you or suggest to you that this person or this person may be good based on their spiritual understanding, is good as a spouse for your life, I think you would, you would pay attention, if not accept, at least you would 
you know, you would give it some serious consideration, especially if it was some very prominent person uh, among the religious leaders of history. And of course, we consider Reverend Moon in that kind of position. So we do respect his guidance. It's not like some kind of a robotic decision where, you know, you're plugged into a relationship which you really don't want, but you're plugged into it anyway. Not at all like that. It is really our conscious choice, and uh, we definitely respect his wisdom. And uh, there are many stories of the incredible, what appears like coincidence in the way that uh, he has uh, all, you know, made some suggestions and matching, and then they discovered afterwards many things which they felt led them to be together. And this is a common experience, actually. So I just wanted to make that, that you, you, to understand how do we think about it. It's really it's, it's based on our respect for and our understanding of Reverend Moon as a person through whom God very much works today. The history of um, arranged marriages is very true. I think in the past it's been primarily political and economic reasons for that, for arranged marriages rather than spiritual. I think that's not important. Mm -hmm. Uh, Th that's why the, the, not politically, you know, like the issue of the, the in our movement, you see, because we believe in a very unique way that the marriage itself was, in other words, from the principal viewpoint, marriage is very holy and special and important. And then, and all that comes with it. And then we say that it was in the very beginning the first ancestors made a ter terrible mistake in the way that they married. <laughs> And then it had all kinds of terrible ramifications. So we give a lot of value to this in a way that many faiths do not. Then, therefore, our marriage is something that we prepare for very seriously and give it a lot of meaning and significance. And so it has a special holy significance, our marriage ceremony. It's not just getting married. It has something to do with salvation, something to do with freedom from the past legacy of sin and self-destructiveness, and the possibility of having children that are free of this affliction. That we believe that in our marriage something new happens and that the children can have a special quality and that the future generations for the world can have some new quality. It's, it's hard to explain all this in the skimpy lectures we've given, but that's what makes it, that's why we take it very seriously. We, are, we allow, some of us choose to have arranged marriages. Those of us that are really dedicated and really believe the principle uh, uh, want to have an arranged marriage because it's the ultimate offering of an unselfishness, of just believing that God will work and letting God arrange our relationship and also believing that we can create love based upon uh, a common purpose and belief. Um, and what actually happens in the arranged marriage is that we find that we come together with someone who has, we share very deep values and purposes in common but know nothing or very little externally about. And what normally happens in typical romantic marriages is that we know a lot about each other externally. I know what kind of music you like, I know if you like spinach souffle, I know if you, you know, like to walk in the rain or something like that, but I don't really know what you're living for and what your deepest values are. And often the other person doesn't really know anyway. And then what sometimes has happened is that after, no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that many, let me explain my point. Let me explain my point. Many times, many people discover, in other words, I myself do not know myself so well sometimes. Many times we discover the person we're married to, very commonly discover the person we're married to is not in the final analysis at all the person we thought. And we're both surprised to find out they both of us discover we change our deep feelings, we change our goals, we suddenly realize that the person is not committed to certain things that we suspect that they were. It's very common, and then people get divorced. So what happens is, rather, that we find a common base, based upon deep, a deep conviction, deep faith, deep beliefs, and, and uh, deep commitment. And then we discover on that foundation that we can be married, and the other things go on as well. The point is, from my experience, it works very well. Uh, many people have been romantically married and it seems fine for them. I'm just saying that it's a very common thing as well that people have a rude awakening to discover one day, gee, I don't really know you. And then, and actually the person says, you know, I didn't know myself either. I didn't know I'd be like this either. I guess we're really strangers, aren't we? And I guess we really don't belong together. It's a very common thing that people experience. 
And uh, so that's why I'm saying that we find ourselves, we get to know each other more internally, that is, in terms of purposes and goals, and then the external thing follows later. For many Now, it's considered uh, a higher standard and higher example of love. You know, I certainly respected those people when I first became a unificationist that did that, because to me it exemplified everything that we're talking about. So a few years ago, marriage in the unification movement is it's a process. There are steps that you go through. You know, it's not just all of a sudden. So the first step is, you know, after you've decided that you want to join the unification movement really completely, you know, full time, then you go through this process of spiritual growth. And you have to you know, during that period most people reflect a lot upon their lives and they ask themselves, how do I want to grow? How do I want to change? something in myself, maybe they look back on their experience growing up in their family, and they think, how can I, probably all of you have, you know, thought from time to time, looking at your parents and their marriage, well, you know, I'd like mine to be a little better in this way, or I'd like to, you know, I'll never turn out like that when I get married, or something like that. So you have this chance to reflect and to, you know, improve certain things and prepare yourself to be able to have confidence to love a person unselfishly. It takes a lot of confidence actually, you know, to believe and trust yourself that I can do this, that I can love another person from God's point of view or with an unselfish kind of love and with real respect for that person. So a lot of people take time. Some need, you know, six years to develop that confidence. Others, you know, develop it more quickly that they feel ready somehow inside themselves. Then they make a commitment and a decision, you know, I want to participate in that, you know. And there's some sort of um, you know, anyway, qualifications or some kind of, you have to show to yourself that you, that you have a certain amount of discipline and trust in your ability to love unselfishly. Okay, then there's the engagement, and all this has been very publicized, you know, in the media and so on. It's very hard to understand that, just looking at it externally, which, you know, it's very hard for us to answer these questions so quickly, you know, the question is a period, you give a lecture two hours explaining the blessing. Uh, the marriage in the education movement, but anyway, the engagement is another step, and you know, you don't, some cases you know the person, sometimes you don't. And, but then there's another time period of some years to get to know the person, so it's not completely strange. Do you understand what I mean? But I think it would be, if indeed you are unmarried, to, um, to the advice or the arranged <laughs> marriage um, coming from the church. What, what's your reaction to uh, the fact that a suggestion is made by Reverend Moon or by someone else who works? Mm. It's an interesting question from the point of view of attitude to me as a Soviet person, because you say, what's your attitude? And as I would say I'm a member of the unification movement, and from my point of view, it's actually, this is an internet project by but uh, it doesn't matter that I'm Soviet and anyway, that I'm Russian because if I'm in the church, it means that I find the common base with the church and I wouldn't say that my reaction would would be very just, it wouldn't be shock for me. Anyway, I'm not married, I'm not engaged. <laughs> so just, I don't, I just want to say that I first heard it and it was a kind of I would say shocked because I've heard many things, many, very many negative things about the movement, about uh, about the church, and actually I went myself to one of the ILS programs like you do, and it was it was last or it was last year, last year, and I know that I before I came I heard so much negativity I didn't hear any good point, and so I've been completely I would say I was completely programmed on rejection on rejecting what I would say. And also I've heard many things about arranged marriages, about blessings and all that stuff. And I just I would say that I was attacking my team leaders and all the ground. What? I am married, yeah, and who's oh he's married to Japanese woman. This is crazy. Just I can't understand it. This is the point I made with many people. But when you work with people and you see that actually after some time when you're in the church, you change internal. I mean, you change, you grow spiritually. That's what Christine has been talking about. And and at the same level, you see a very different view on all the things. And I know that for me, that's 
That's what I'd like to do because I'd like um, to, to grow more and that's a kind of offering I can make. And really, I'm very happy I can have this opportunity. That's not so you, you plan to go through a process of growth and that, uh, that was a very key point in her life that uh, she had reached. And uh, the reason for her decision was that she did completely, if you have, have to put yourself in that position, uh, a husband who has an incredible dr drive to do something that seems totally inconsistent and crazy with the common everyday situation facing you. And so it was very difficult for her to trust how God was guiding Reverend Moore, how Reverend Moore felt God was guiding him. So when he received this, he, re he said God called him to go to North Korea. And God had been calling him and do to do many different things around South Korea as he was trying to build his movement. And so she felt a lack of attention, in a sense, even though he loved her incredibly. So when he finally received this call to North Korea, you know, it gradually had been more than she could bear, and she couldn't follow him. And so she divorced him. You know, it was a very, very incredibly painful thing for him. And uh, all his life, after that point, he had kept trying to reach her, to bring her back at least into the movement. And then she finally came back. But uh, his marriage, his, his personal mission in life, he felt he had to proceed. And so, you know, he remarried before she ever came back. But after she came back along, I don't want to go into much more detail about it, but she did came back into, come back into the movement as a unificationist. The point I would add is that both uh, Reverend Moon and his wife felt that, according to our understanding of the principle, they felt they had to go through certain kind of uh, challenges and trials before they would achieve a certain kind of position, uh, status of their marriage, and actually to be the leaders of our movement and, and as a couple. And so in other words, simply marrying one another was not enough. They both had to go through many trials until they could reach a certain kind of victory, personally. Neither one of them uh, could do that alone. And with uh, Hak Shahan, both uh, Samyal Moon and Hak Shahan were able to together achieve, <coughs> overcome many hurdles, and establish that position which they now have. So it simply wasn't the fact that she, he was, she was his wife, uh, but that both of them had to go through a certain kind of a growth period to qualify, and <coughs> she failed. And anyway, they divorced. Isn't this contradictory? A deeply spiritual moment, and that is, I knowing myself, my own personal experience, because we had many very, people had very deep experiences with God through that process. A sense of incredible cleansing and purification and rebirth through the blessing. And that's the real aspect as we understand it. It's a spiritual ceremony of transformation and purification. And we try to prepare ourselves for that. As a communist and as the sharing of material poverty, now, the way I see the university movement is the sharing of a, a system of thought and purpose. Now, would you, would you put, would someone please come and validate this statement that is a communist in the sense that it's a, a, a communal experience and those <coughs> If communism is sharing a property in common and also sharing maybe thought, is uh, what are we doing in this kind of a movement? Does it resemble perhaps, or how does it relate to communism? Uh, it's more communalism perhaps, or community. Communism is associated with a particular way of looking at, it's not just the sharing of property, because families do that, but it's a particular way of interpreting what human potential is. Um, how people should relate to each other. It's a whole interpretation of the universe, as a matter of fact. It's a whole vast system of belief. And it's, uh, unificationism is exactly opposite of Marxism-Leninism on those, almost every point. It's almost like the mirror image, exactly opposite. In that way, then our movement is quite different. Except of this unification movement and the divine principle and uh, I can certainly understand how many religions and, and even atheists could come to espouse uh, these beliefs. 
but uh, maybe you can help me with two major problems that I have. Uh, you say that Reverend Moon is uh, continuing an, an admission that was unfilled by Christ when he was alive, right? So, uh, in that in that vein, aren't you to a certain extent discrediting what he, what he has done, his his greatest sacrifice? Aren't you aren't you in a way saying that his death was his greatest undoing, when in fact it was his greatest accomplishment? And also, when Christ was alive, it seems to me that all of his teachings and all of his works were to prepare souls for heaven, for the kingdom to come, and 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 their union with God in heaven. Yet. Um, and, and if this movement is in fact a continuation of that, then, then why does it seem that all, you know, all the progress that you seem to be working towards and all your endeavors seem to be more mundane and of, earth, you know, of earthly goals? You, know, you seem to be trying to create an ideal world on earth. And, and to me, um, I don't know, you know, well, regardless of whether or not that's possible, but, you know, um, Back in the time of Christ, it was those people with this same kind of self-righteous attitude, you know, those people who were most earnestly looking for the Messiah that, that completely denied him. You know, and, and, and in my personal belief, I believe that I am nothing more than a sinner, and I never will be. And that is why I, I will be saved. Not because I'm going to, you know, pretend to be an, an ideal man or work towards, you know, such a goal. Because what, what is on this earth will be over when it's over. And then, and then you pass on, and then you go to heaven, and then, and then that's when your soul is ready to become ideal. Mm -hmm. Let's start with his second, okay? Um, you know, Christ said when he, when someone asked him how should we pray, he said that you should pray, "Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven." And this prayer is a reflection of the love of God. Because if you just think of a, of a family again, if you think of a parent, then no parent, every parent is going to want to try and give the best to their child while they're alive. The best to them, and they're gonna hope that they can experience that in their life on earth as well as uh, in their afterlife. So the same is true of God. That desire comes from God. You know, you can ask any parent around the world and they have the same desire for their children. So it's not something that's exclusive that we believe that uh, you know perfection and, and the ideal life is for uh, the spiritual world. That's something that we have to experience here. How can any of us really be happy if if, if you're if you say you become very successful in your profession and you become a wealthy man, but your brother is starving to death? Can you and you love him very much? Can you in your heart really be content and happy and free? knowing that he's dying and starving. So I mean, on a larger sense, it's the same way. We can never just try and preserve our own uh, comfort, our own individual you know, salvation or union. We can never just be satisfied with that. We have to try and create a, a world in which everyone has a relationship with God and which everyone can experience the, the fruits, the benefits of what God wanted us all to experience from this incredible environment that we're um, born in. But that sort of takes the kingdom of selfless love. That's what actually makes heaven, in our view. That God's selfless love prevails in such a world. And if you think about it, just from a logical point of view, if you really love somebody, you really love them and care about them, and by some unfortunate situation, or for you fortunate, but for them unfortunate, you end up in heaven, and the person that you love the most is in hell. Can you feel you're in heaven while your person you love the most is in hell? Even if your personal life, in a sense, allows you to get to heaven, but the ones you love are in hell. Or can you just totally ignore them because you're in heaven and think it doesn't matter, it's too bad they didn't make it? So, one of the central teachings of the unification principle is that we don't enter heaven just as an individual, but as a family. And if we truly are people of love, we won't even want to go to heaven without the rest of the world with us. So it's an all-inclusive concept of salvation. One of the major aspects of your question, aren't we uh, somehow devaluing Jesus or saying that Jesus is less than uh, uh, divine or whatever, or less than what we well, think I of him as? Well, specifically referring to his death, right? Yeah. Are we devaluing that, it? That was mm -hmm. his greatest accomplishment. 
You are more than devaluing. You're completely disavowing. You're saying he messed up. He shouldn't have died. No, he didn't. <laughs> he didn't mess up, but we, we certainly did. People certainly did at this time. And uh, I think this is the key point, you know. The process of restoration and salvation is not something that it just comes. God doesn't have some people predestined to go to heaven and other people not. From the unification principle point of view, is that the process of restoration and salvation is based upon a cooperative relationship between God's inspiration and guidance and human responsibility. God sent the Messiah. God sent the Messiah. It was human responsibility to follow. Jesus said, there's many sections in the Bible where you can read where somebody did believe in him. And he said, no, your sins are forgiven. So, so there's a, this is a big theological controversy. Jesus, could he forgive sins before his crucifixion? Or did he have to go through the crucifixion to forgive sins? Clearly, there's evidence in the Bible that he had been forgiving sins of people before the crucifixion. You know, whole traditions are built upon this, uh, this interpretation. But in any case, he had the ability to bring salvation because he was the Messiah. He didn't have to die to do that. He had. that the Russian brothers and sisters here are able to show something to Americans. In other words, I've experienced something among the Russian brothers and sisters that, and the Ukrainians and the others, and so do you, that I think I wouldn't have been able to necessarily experience elsewhere. So the reason why we did this was because I think that the effect of being with the uh, Soviet members would be different for you than being with American members that you're actually able to understand something about our movement more effectively among the Soviet members than you would in the New Yorker in New York. That's definitely one of the reasons. That, the, that Sasha, for instance, was able to convey something about her. The, the chemistry between Russians and Americans is something, you're actually experiencing something of the principle right here with being two enemy nations and all of our interesting interactions. You're experiencing something that would not be experienced with Americans. That's the main reason. Um, and it's precisely, it's precisely like many of us, when we first met the movement, uh, we met, uh, we, we first ran into an international group. And uh, many people were involved in America from other countries. And it was sitting in the midst of an international group, hearing the lectures and seeing the way people related. Somehow it was a combination of hearing the idea and then just sort of feeling it, that it suddenly clicked. And that's why uh, I think the idea was that by coming here and meeting the young members here, you would experience something you would never had you done in America. That's one of the reasons. Yeah, well, to answer this without understanding unification theology more yourself. Yeah, but it's an important point to be if you yeah. tell people that you can still practice your religion and, and be a unification. If that's the case, we can't, really. Mm -hmm. You want to go? <laughs> I know this is a big point for most of you, and um, of course it is for all of us. When we first study the principle, the, the obvious conclusion, it, or presumed conclusion, is that Reverend Moon is the Messiah. And, you know, the one point that all of us have to understand is that the Unification Church doesn't decide who the Messiah is. Christians don't decide who the Messiah is. None of us decide who the Messiah is, except for God. So we have to all try and find out from God and looking within ourselves who the Messiah is. It's not for 
You know, it's not something that we decide somebody is, uh, of our own accord is, is, is or is not the Messiah. We can only know no, from I'm God. Just, I'm just saying that if that's a comment and an observation, and uh, it's not directed at the panel, it's directed really to the audience, to everyone in the room. Um, I'm different than anyone in this room in as um, you were raised as um, Christians or, or whatever religion you were raised as as a child. Um, none of you, and when I was two years old, my parents joined the Unification Church. As a child, I was raised hearing something that I don't think there aren't, I don't think there are any kids in this room that there are, I know there aren't any blessed children, right? there aren't any kids even whose parents joined at a young, when they were young. Um, I was raised with something completely different than any of you. Um, through my life, um, you know, because I was raised with something so different, I, you know, I really looked to many different religions. I went to a private Baptist school. I went to a private Catholic school. I've been to almost every denomination of Christian church. That I've attended, you know, many church services. I've spoken with many people. Um, people have, you know, talked to me and, and, and wanted to, uh, right now I'm non-denominational, but I have many different, you know, views of, of different, I have many opinions of different aspects of religion. Um, but when people have, told me that their opinions and their beliefs, um, and I'm not directing this to everyone in the audience because I know that a lot of you didn't say this, but I've heard many people say that, that they didn't want to hear the lectures because somehow they were offensive to them, because this is not what they were raised to believe. Well, I wasn't raised to believe what you were raised to believe, but I listen to many things and I've never, I've never accused anyone of trying to offend me, because I feel like when someone tries, when someone feels really strongly, and they, and they want to share that with you. They're not trying to offend you, they're just trying to inform you. And I think everyone needs to remember that. So the principle, I just like to say that the principle itself doesn't say anything about such things, but tries to give us guidance. I came to, regarding Reverend Moon's identity, I believe, yes, that Jesus has commissioned him, that in fact Jesus, uh, Jesus' mission is being fulfilled for him, and that Jesus' second coming is through him, indeed. That uh, just the same way that John the Baptist was Elijah's uh, second coming, like his second self, the one to carry out his mission on earth, Indeed, the same way. Or the way that Joshua was anointed by God to be like a second Moses. And Moses was given a mission to carry the people to Canaan. And then Moses was uh, unable to do that, was prevented. And so then God, God uh, so like Joshua fulfilled it for him. And so the mission of the Messiah, the office of the Messiah, has been carried by Jesus and is now being carried on earth by Reverend Moon. I believe that because of... Uh, because of what I've seen, because of the, th the message that he brought, the, the wisdom that he has, the way he has lived and his understanding of God's heart, for many reasons I believe that's true. And that Jesus' uh, pain and his anguish over the world is now being comforted through Reverend Moon, whom he called to do. Uh, and and uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. But one question, uh, 
that uh, the deprogrammers would often ask, what would you do if River Moon told you to kill your parents? Would you do it? Like that, I mean, this kind of thing. So I would say, no, of course not. If he told me to do it, I wouldn't do it. And it would also demonstrate to me that he's totally, you know, you know, off the wall. <laughs> you know, the fact is that uh, my personal experience with River Moon has been that everything that I've ever seen he has lived up to a standard of personal love and, and relationship to God that, you know, that I really respect. And so I came to my own personal decision in relationship to how I view River Moon over a long period of time. And, uh, and also to my own personal search and my own personal prayer. You know. And that's why I don't think anybody can tell you who to believe or what to believe about somebody. But ultimately only God can tell you. And that it has to be based upon your personal search. The unification principle allowed me to sort out my ideas. It gave me the opportunity to sort out what I thought about God or my purpose in life or that the cause of evil is intellectual. So the unification principle provided me answers that I couldn't find through Catholicism or through the Baptists or the other people that I had been in contact with. And then through that intellectual understanding, it motivated me to begin my own personal search, and then my own personal conviction to a river moon came after that. Well, are there any my experience with Flexible, the program that we offered, he really inspires people with a vision, you know, but then the responsibility for carrying that out, and that how it gets done, is really put into the hands of those people. For example, just along that line, the Dr. Rubenstein mentioned about uh, this. Uh, um, could you kind of elaborate on what your, um, what your goal was as far as bringing us here? Did you basically want us to, I'm sure you probably wanted us to join, but did you want us to go back basically with positive hype about, about your organization? And can you say whether or not if that goal was accomplished? Please, 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 please. <laughs> <laughs> Any part of it at all? Positive hype. <laughs> have a really wonderful experience, that you would have an experience that would help you deeply in your life, whether you join or not, genuinely. Whether you decide to accept everything you hear or not, I think all of us feel that maybe this is something that's really needed, you know, for uh, people who are in school and college is to have a, some kind of extraordinary opportunity to think deeply about life, to think deeply about these questions. And you hear a, a statement of you stated, you hear a set of ideas stated clearly, and maybe it seems strong to you, but it's something you can bounce off of and come to a deeper understanding of what do you believe to understand, to know yourself better, to, to discover something inside yourself and to grow. And I believe that I mean I think we share that we believe that'll help you no matter what you do in the future. It'll help you, it'll help your country, it'll help your school. Also, uh, let me just con continue that. The the title of this conference is International Leadership Seminar on Leadership for the Twenty First Century. Uh, we did not come here with my idea that we're going to get you all to join the unification movement and this kind of thing. That is not our thinking whatsoever. We are concerned about leadership. Now, you may think, and some of you have even said, and I don't know how you feel now, but at least earlier you said that we felt you were deceived into coming here, all this kind of stuff. We really are concerned about future leadership. So, I think that through this whole process that you have been through here, you know, uh, meaning the whole experience of coming to uh, Russia, uh, hearing these ideas, interacting with people, I think uh, maybe you broadened your mind. Did you? I think some of you did that. You broadened your mind about yourself, perhaps, about others, about the country, about the world. That is an important element in leadership. Also, we brought to the surface many important questions about values, which is very, very fundamental in the, any kind of leader. And also, we shared with you about the ideals, the life, and the accomplishments of a man who we consider one of the most significant leaders in the 20th century. That is Reverend Moore. And we are sharing with you the ideals that motivated him to do what he's doing. So maybe you can learn from that something. But uh, whether you accept the theological concepts or whatever, that's entirely up to you. It is natural that if I believe something to be true, it is normal and natural that I would like everybody else to share the same belief, just as much as you as a Catholic or a Baptist feel, right? Don't you want to share what you believe? But we have no intention of imposing upon you our beliefs, but we would definitely want to inform you of our beliefs and share with uh, you our inspiration, which has helped us in our life. 
So that's it. And I just wanted to share some of my experience. Um, I met Carl in uh, January, and I started studying. And uh, I, I was really negative about it because I started reading some books, you know, negative things. My family was pretty negative and still is. But I wasn't, you know, I was just through a lot of struggles. And I had, you know, knew about the blessing and the belief of whether moon being the Messiah. I didn't accept that. Even when I would go to the lectures, you know, they always had this picture of the moon and this moon, and I just didn't like seeing it. But I loved the principle. I loved the teaching, you know, loving it conditionally. And I just, you know, I even moved to the, um, moved into some place, <coughs> you know, to center. But still, I didn't accept Messiah being the, you know, the moon being the Messiah. So every time I'd be praying, I was looking down. Because I like the principle, you know, I like the teaching. So I continue doing that, but just wanted to share that um, I realized that the principle, the teaching, Reverend Moon is the, the principle. You know, and now it's, it's not like knowing, you know, directly he's the Messiah or not, but his way of living, you know, he's teaching something and he's living it. So I just really appreciate, doesn't matter if he's the Messiah or not, you know, what he. It took him to get the principle, it was a lot. It, it probably was that, just think about if it was a mailman, you know, or any kind of person, humble person from the street. But the brought this principle to us, it's very special, you know. So it doesn't have to be directly like, it's like a title on this Messiah, you know, any person. But just brought this hope for the young people, this really new truth and new inspiration <coughs> for everyone. We should really appreciate that, you know. Um, now, um, I went to Mexico, and my parents were pretty negative about it. And they just didn't want me to go back to education. Because they, they just told me, if you go back, you're not part of the family. At that moment, I had to make a really uh, deep uh, decision, whether my family or my belief. So that they were <laughs> But these <coughs> questions that you're making, it cannot be answered in books or persons. The only way of answering is just a uh, personal prayer, really sincerely asking God. If you also believe in God, please ask Him. Do not ask Him or read any books or persons. It's really directed, and you can really get the answer. I really appreciate that God really uh, gave me the strength to come back. No matter what my family is against, but after having this, this experience, deep personal experience with God, it was really deep, I'll never forget it. And I really ask you all, please don't try to see negative things, just the good things. Even if you don't believe that he's the Messiah, or he is, take the good things. And then later on, just please pray, with true prayer, you'll find the answer, not through books, neither through persons. You may hear them, but the only, the ultimately, ultimately, answer will be prayer, personal experience with God. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to say something to what, I'm sorry, I don't hear your name. Um, Right, because I've really been in kind of the same situation. I mean, because for me, I even have not, because developing, you have, the natural faith isn't just a kind of blind faith. You have to develop your faith in everything. And I should say that for me, I had even to develop my faith in God, because I'm in a kind of different situation from you, coming from Marxist Leninist background, and from a very secular background, I would say. and. Even if you first I made a decision I wanted to believe in God, just in, it was intellectual decision, but until I really experienced God, until I really started feeling with my heart what does it mean God's love, I just couldn't say. Uh, it was very different. So I would say that faith and knowledge is very different. And that's the same thing for me with the answer, whether the Red Moon is Messiah or not. Because I would say that that's been the question. I've been putting the answer aside for a while because I've been doing many things 
many, many different things within the unification movement and within CAP, with the CAP, and I really enjoyed it in one sense, and I really felt that there's very deep meaning in what I'm doing. But that was a question I couldn't give the answer for myself because I just didn't have much experience. I've never met Trevor Moon and just I've never met many pe I didn't talk much with people who had personal experiences with them. Although later I met many people who really had them. And so I put this question aside for some time just before really I can get the answer or something for myself because I really decided that it doesn't matter for me because really that's not the core of the problem. But Actually, I would say that late, maybe, it was this summer, actually, I had a kind of experience that, it wasn't an experience with Reverend Moon, but I should say that it was experience with Mrs. Moon, and I really, it was a kind of spiritual experience that I had, and it was a very difficult time for me, and it was the time of the coup in this country, and I wasn't here, and I was in America at this time, and the news on the mass media that I, the things I read in the newspapers really made me crazy because I felt desperate to know the situation in my country, to know what's going on with my parents because I had the impression that a kind of blood mess up here going on. And so really I had an experience I really felt and actually before the coup was over I felt to some extent that it would be okay that all the things would pass and I know it was a spiritual experience and so I get the answer from online hand for myself. And so I would say that I'm really looking forward maybe to have an experience with Reverend Moon, just spiritual experience. That's a kind of so the point I will make is that every answer that you give is it's up to you. It's your decision and at certain point if you want if you come to the point when you really are able to experience something and you receive something, then you're very lucky, and that's what I mean. Okay, well, you're yeah, we in the door. <coughs> and also, did somebody lose a key with a broken thing? Somebody lost yeah, a key? No. Okay, what? Well, leave it in the door. Where you go? Um, also, the clipboards.